thank you, Mei Jiang and all the organizers uh, for um, having me here. I'm so delighted to meet everyone. Uh, let me start. So today I'd like to share some historical narratives of Zainichi or Korean residents of Japan. Um, as Dr. Monet uh, kindly introduced, um, well, first of all, I'm not a historian who is specialized in Zainichi history, but I today I wanted to add some perspective to the diasporic experiences of Zainichi community and more broadly um, Asian diaspora by bringing colonialism into the picture. Uh, I think it'll be helpful or useful to talk about myself first to explain how I became um, drawn to the stories of Zainichi. Uh, I was born and raised in South Korea and um, the country um, is, I believe some of you may know that, it's a country where national identity is not questioned enough. If you're born with the Korean citizenship, just like the 97% of uh, the population of Korea. And coming to the United States to study um, in the PhD program and also settling down here now in Vancouver Island in Canada over the past 10 something years, um, it allowed me to finally raise a question regarding my relationship with this abstract concept called nation, uh, the term that I have been trying to historicize and also deconstruct as a historian, but hardly um, occurred to me as a subject to reflect upon um, in my personal life. Uh, it finally became a problematic category as my life as a migrant um, has moved forward. So this is where I became so intrigued by uh, the historical experience of Zainichi Koreans in Japan. Of course, um, I know I shouldn't be too excited about using their narratives merely as a source of academic uh, inspiration. And I feel like that's kind of um, psychopathic detachment from historical narratives, which ends up uh, reducing the stories of human sufferings merely into an object, uh, which is the last thing I would wanna do as a scholar but rather the historical experience of uh, Zainichi people who have been occupying such a liminal space between uh, imperial citizens and stateless refugees between Korea and Japan, between even two Koreas, North and South Korea, and lastly, uh, between insiders and outsiders, allowed me to uh, reorient the question of identity. Uh, that is to say, liminality, uh, not as an exception, but as a essential human condition that becomes pronounced only when one tr uh, transgresses or push to transgress borders, whether it means physical border or cultural borders. So here, um, let me briefly um, explain um, about the historical experience of Zainichi. Um, I think I should go back to the first page. Um, to uh, talk about the name itself. So Korean residents in Japan are normally called Zainichi, which literally means present in Japan or being in Japan. The literal meaning, uh, which is presence, can be very misleading because of their continued vulnerable status in terms of citizenship, their ethnic identity. Although ethnic Korean residents have been present throughout the 20th century and beyond, they have been treated like a permanent others, uh, both by Japan and, and by two Koreas. And in view of this, it is fair to say that Zainichi people have been simultaneously present and absent. Um, then how did Zainichi Koreans end up in Japan? Uh, the history goes back to the colonial period, as may, many of you know, and, and then the uh, fall of the empire uh, back in 1945. And during the colonial period, Koreans uh, moved to the Japanese mainland either voluntarily or involuntarily. And before the war, the Asia Pacific War, many Korean farmers lost their land because of the land expropriation policy under the Japanese uh, rule. And many Koreans migrate to Japan as a ship laborers, uh, as, uh, for example, at construction sites. And in addition to that, those who had sufficient capitals or uh, political status to afford education came to Japan to receive higher education. Um, during the wartime period, the number of Korean residents drastically increased because of the this forceful mobilization of Koreans as 
wartime factory workers or mine workers, and also as military servicemen. And when it comes to their origin, more than 90% uh, came from the southern part of Korea where extreme poverty prevailed during the colonial period. Uh, then what uh, happened to this Korean diaspora after the collapse of the empire? There were over 140,000 Koreans who went back to their home country um, after its liberation from Japan. On the other hand, there were another group of people who decided to remain in Japan even after the liberation. Uh, there are people who formed an ethnic, I mean, these are the people who formed an ethnic uh, minority group in Japan called Zainichi Koreans or simply Zainichi in the post war period. Then a question arises, why did uh, these ethnic Koreans continue living in Japan even after the liberation of Korea from the Japanese empire? Uh, this is related to the post-war or post-liberation circumstance uh, in Korea. So some people chose to stay in Japan for multiple reasons. The poor economic condition in their home country, in particular, the lack of housing and jobs deter them from going back. And more importantly, political instability and conflicts in the post-liberation period made them feel even harder to be repatriated. Uh, especially people who were involved in the left-wing groups uh, could be arrested or purged if they went back to South Korea. I mentioned earlier that 90% of them um, came from the Southern part, not the Northern part. And uh, if they go back to their hometown, uh, it was possible that they could be purged under the circumstance. So some of the people who were repatriated to Korea initially fled uh, back to Japan uh, to avoid the red purge of South Korean government. Um, Probably some of you may know about Jeju rising uh, between 1948 to 1949 and um, the violent suppression of civilians in Jeju under Seungman Bae, the, um, at the time president. This became a major factor causing uh, the residents fleeing to Japan. And in the post-war period, their status was redefined uh, by the US occupying forces uh, that, uh, that occupied Japanese mainly until 1952, they were no longer imperial subjects of the Japanese empire, of course, because there's no empire anymore, but they are now registered as aliens. Uh, this, suggests, this suggests that they remain stateless refugees because of the absence of the official government in both sides of Korea. And finally, in 1948, two separate governments were established uh, each side in the South Republic of Korea and in the North, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Um, in addition uh, to the stateless um, status, ethnic Koreans in Japan force economic hardship because of the limited employment opportunities, racism and prejudice against uh, Korean residents. So majority of Koreans remained unemployed or became low wage workers or it, and eventually engaged in some illegal activities such as black market, smuggling, and as you all know, pachinko. Uh, these unlawful images are still associated with Zainichi even today, uh, which function as a racial stigma in Japanese society. And over time, there were some changes in the experience of Zainichi Koreans, and this is really, um, well, I mean, um, contextualized by the Cold War uh, situation. So just as Korean Peninsula was divided along ideological lines, Zainichi Koreans were also divided largely into two groups. So South Korean affiliation group uh, is called Minda, uh, that was established in 1948, and North Korean affiliation group is called Chongnya, that was established in 1955. And uh, Korean War, brought um, about this sharp, sharp division of Koreans along uh, ideological lines. Uh, interestingly, the two Koreas made different efforts to support ethnic Koreans in Japan. Uh, between 1959 to 1984, North Korea at the time campaigned for the repatriation of Zionichi group in collaboration with Japan Red Cross Society. And that resulted in the repatriation of um, over 90,000 ethnic uh, Koreans to North Korea, even if they are not originally from North Korea. And not surprisingly, these returnees were used as a tool for the state propaganda. 
and they return to their ideological motherland only to find themselves in the midst of uh, hardship and poverty. And in the meantime, South Korea normalized the diplomatic ties with Japan in 1965. And under this treaty between two countries, Sinoja Koreans who had remained as uh, aliens by the time were now allowed to obtain the rights of permanent residents if they choose South Korean nationality. Uh, more than 50% of Sinoji um, obtained permanent residency by maintaining South Korean citizenship and approximately 40% of uh, people who support North Korea refused to obtain uh, permanent residence status, uh, and they still remain as aliens. And only a small number of Sinoji uh, chose naturalization. Uh, and as of 2021, there are approximately 410,000 Korean residents in Japan currently uh, who maintain their um, uh, Korean nationality while staying in Japan as a permanent residence. Um, throughout uh, the poster period, Sinichi group have faced systemic uh, and cultural discrimination, uh, including ethnic discrimination in job and marriage opportunities, and uh, so-called um, fingerprinting enforcement. Um, this, is, this is very notorious in uh, practice. Um, and fingerprinting is a colonial tool for biosurveillance, as many of you know. And it was not until 1993 that the surveillance system was finally abolished. Um, and although majority of Sinich people obtained the status permanent residence, uh, they are not entitled um, to vote for general elections. And the lack of political rights they held uh, prevents the changes in uh, immigration systems from happening because their voices hardly fit into the policymaking process, uh, especially the lack of support for the Korean schools and systemic disadvantages and discrimination against Korean schools and lack of welfare um, system for um, uh, foreigners, including Koreans such as pensions and health insurance, etc. And hate speech targeting Zainichi um, and anti-Korean protests are relatively um, a, a few, I mean, a new phenomenon. Uh, there's a group called Saitokukai. Uh, they have been protesting against the extension of suffrage and welfare programs to foreign nationals and especially Korean residents in Japan. And um, they have made racial inserts by calling uh, Zainichi people as criminals and demanding them to leave the country. Uh, just like right wing people or racist people in North America. Um, I'd like to conclude uh, my presentation with this concept liminality. Um, anthropologist Victor Turner, he said about liminality that liminal uh, entities are neither here nor there. They are betwixt and between the positions assigned and arrayed by law, custom, convention, and ceremonial. Um, Zainichi Koreans' experiences of struggling between two nations or conversely being recognized nowhere as proper citizens or nationals uh, push us to think against the naturalized sense of national belonging. Um, Zainichi's narrative uh, moving from the imperial subject to stateless refugees and then to being uh, forced to choose nationality uh, reveals uh, to us a sort of regulatory fiction around inclusion and exclusion. In other words, the fiction of nation that put all of us somewhere between inclusion and exclusion. Uh, this is all for me. Uh, I'd like to hear your question and comments afterwards. Thank you so much.